Just a day after scrapping a Singapore summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, U.S. President Trump has said that meeting scheduled for June 12 could still happen. Donald Trump said, and I quote, we'll see what it happens. It could even be the 12th we are talking to them now. North Korea very much wants to do it. We'd like to do it as well. South Korean Prime Minister Lee nak Hyun has said that, the, that he regrets and is sorry that the historic U.S.-North Korea summit has been cancelled. Lee also said that he was not pessimistic and still had a hope. Well, leaders have expressed deep concern over Trump's decision to call off the planned summit with Kim. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has urged the two parties to continue their dialogue and to find a path to the peaceful and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The Netherlands has held Russia responsible for the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight 17 in July 2014. 298 passengers aboard had lost their lives in the mishap. Dutch Foreign Minister Steph Bloch had said that Australia has joined the Netherlands in its call on Russia to accept its responsibility. The Netherlands has also urged Russia to fully cooperate on achieving justice for the victims of flight MH17. President Vladimir Putin has rebuffed Dutch investigators' claims for Russia's involvement in downing of Malaysian Airlines plane in 2014. Putin has said that a Russian army missile did not bring down MH17 over eastern Ukraine. The Dutch investigators had concluded that a Russian missile system was used in the attack. People in Ireland have voted in a landmark referendum on whether the country should liberalise some of the strictest abortion laws. Voter turnout has been recorded comparatively higher and Irish Prime Minister Varadkar said he is confident that the people have voted in favour of making changes in the abortion laws. French President Macron called on Russia to work hand-in-hand -hand with Europe to end what he called as one of the most difficult periods of our history. Macron was speaking at a business forum in St. Petersburg in Russia, where he also called for closer ties between France and Russia despite their differences. Macron is in Russia, where he is siding up to Vladimir Putin on a two-day trip to St. Petersburg. Spain's biggest opposition party, the Socialists, has filed a no-confidence motion against Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy after his party was found guilty of benefiting from illegal funds in a corruption trial. Rajoy has said that he could not call a snap election after opposition threatened to bring down the government. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has said that Russia and Japan should sign a peace treaty so that they can realize their economic cooperation ambitions. Russia and Japan have not signed an official peace treaty after World War II due to a dispute over a number of Pacific islands off the northeast coast of Japan. Russian President Vladimir Putin has launched a veiled attack at the United States. Putin has said that some countries were using sanctions as part of their trade policy and complained that protectionism was on the rise globally. The U.S. had imposed new sanctions on 24 Russians last month. Nations that remain in the Iran nuclear deal have met to save the pact in Vienna. This is the first talk of the signatories after President Donald Trump declared the U.S. withdrawal on May 8th. British, Chinese, French, German and Russian officials first had preliminary talks and all vowed to stick to the Iran nuclear deal in the future. Leaders then proceeded to have formal discussions with Iranian representatives. Russian President Putin has commented on Washington's decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. Putin has said that unilateral steps taken by countries like the United States led to a dead end and were always counterproductive. 
Putin also said Washington's flip-flopping on international agreements after the election of new U.S. president has generated mistrust. China has said that it remains committed to the Iran nuclear deal and calls for the full implementation of the accord by all relevant parties. China has also raised concern over the future of the deal after U.S. president that he would pull his country out of the agreement and reimpose sanctions on Iran. The head of Tunisia's Truth Tribunal, which is tasked with examining crimes under the country's dictatorship, has been allowed to resume its work. The Truth and Dignity Commission was set up to investigate human rights violations going back six decades following the 20, 2011 ousting of dictator Abedin Ben Ali. The tribunal faced an uncertain future after lawmakers voted in March to end its work. Thousands of Palestinians have joined the latest round of protests along the Gaza border with Israel to press the demand for return. Israeli troops resorted to tear gas shelling and fired live rounds in response to those who approached the fence and tried to pull it apart. At least 86 protesters have been reportedly hurt in these protests. Over a dozen people have been injured in an explosion at a restaurant in Mississauga, a suburb of the Canadian city of Toronto. Two men had reportedly set off bomb in the restaurant. Fifteen injured people have been taken to the hospital after the blast. The incident comes a month after a driver ploughed his white rider rental van into a crowd in Toronto, killing ten people and injuring fifteen. Two more people have died from Ebola virus and seven new cases have been confirmed in Democratic Republic of Congo. The outbreak is believed to have killed at least 27 people so far. Health officials in Congo are concerned over Ebola's presence in Mabandaka, which is a transportation hub and home to over one million people. The mayor of Sao Paulo has declared a state of emergency in Brazil's economic capital due to a five-day-old trucker strike that has left the country crippled. The measure would allow city authorities to seize private goods such as fuel. Truckers are protesting against rising fuel prices. They have been blocking highways and urban traffic disrupting transportation in a nation that relies heavily on road transportation. Now, the survivors of the plane crash just outside Havana Airport last week has died, raising the death toll from one of Cuba's worst air disasters to 112. Cuba is leading the probe into the crash together with Mexican and U.S. investigators and has retrieved the black box with flight data and voice recordings from the cockpit. Three female pedestrians have been struck by a hit-and-run driver in Portland. Two of the women have sustained serious injuries. Police are investigating the case and have made one arrest so far. Witnesses have described a vehicle being driven onto a sidewalk and striking the women before speeding off. Guatemalan authorities have called on the U.S. government and its border agents to respect the lives of their citizens regardless of their immigration status. The authorities have demanded an investigation after a Guatemalan migrant was allegedly killed by a U.S. border agent near the southern border. Iraqi Prime Minister Heather al-Abadi has announced the formation of a commission to study re reports, information and all documents relating to the electoral process. Iraqi authorities have launched an inquiry into this month's parliamentary elections after intelligence services found that the voting machines used were vulnerable to hacking. In a move to raise awareness about plastic pollution, long-distance swimmer Ben Leconte is preparing to embark on an attempt to swim across the Pacific Ocean, covering 9,100 kilometers. Leconte and his nine-person support team will set out from Tokyo to San Francisco on Tuesday. 
The epic expedition is expected to last over six months. The biggest restaurant in Europe has opened in Paris and is called La Felicita. The latest hotspot in Paris is a new eatery from restaurant group Big Mama. The restaurant will put on a range of cultural activities including DJ sets, live concerts, art exhibitions, street art, summer festivals, film screenings and World Cup football showings. A large steel box beam suspension bridge is nearing completion over a waterway in South China's Yongdang province. The bridge is claimed to have the largest span in the world with a main span of 1,688 meters and is built with 176 steel boxes. It has eight lanes in both directions with a maximum driving speed of 100 km per hour. The iconic Sydney Opera House and other landmarks burst forth with vibrant colours and effervescence as the annual Vivid Light Festival celebrated its 10th birthday on Friday. The 23-night event features more than 90 light installations across Sydney. The three-day VivaTech Startup Technology Summit is on in the French capital of Paris. Several global tech giants are attending the Technology Expo where manufacturers displayed a new generation of robots with a hope that robots get a place in houses across the globe. The event sees executives discuss the positive impact of technology and innovation to the society. Vintage bottles of yellow wine dating back to 1774 will be for sale at French auction. The bottles of Herbois Vin Juan are among the oldest finds in the world and are estimated at $17,000 to $23,000 each. Along with the three new vintage samples, 102 other vintage bottles will also go under the hammer. Thousands of protesters rallied in Argentina's downtown Buenos Aires against President Mauricio Macri. Macri had sparked a controversy earlier this month after announcing that Argentina would seek a loan from the IMF. It stoked fears that the country would once again face the devastating economic collapse of 2001 to 2002. Opposition parties, unions, human rights organizations and artists took part in the march. Peruvian authorities have seized over 8 million counterfeit dollars, euros and souls in separate operations across the capital city of Lima. Police said they arrested five suspects and raided three sites in the districts of Brenna, San Juan, the Lura Ganco and Cursajo de Lima. And it's over to news from India. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Bangladeshi counterpart Sheikh Hasina have inaugurated the Bangladesh Bhavan at India's eastern town of Shantiniketan. The building will house a library, a state-of-the-art archival centre and a seminar hall besides a sprawling space for cultural get-togethers. Popular floating restaurant Arctic Bar off the coast or near Mumbai's Bandra capsized. The yacht turned floating restaurant sank under the possible impact of huge tidal waves triggered by the Mekuni cyclone. At least 15 people on board, mostly crew, were immediately rescued as the vessel tilted and were taken ashore in small motorboats.
Political turmoil in India's southern state Karnataka has finally come to an end after the JDS Congress coalition proved majority in the state assembly. CM HD Kumaraswamy won floor test after 117 MLAs voted in his favor. Karnataka had been witnessing political uncertainty for the past 10 days since the election results came out on May 15th. India's ruling party, the BJP, will launch a 15-day program to mark the fourth anniversary of the Modi government. Party President Amit Shah will lead an exercise to reach out to one lakh personalities from different walks of life to highlight its achievements. The program will start on May 27th in which all ministers of the party will reach out to personalities or experts or influential people across the country. So when the BJP is celebrating four years of completion of its government, the opposition party Congress has said that it will mark the fourth anniversary of Modi government today as Betrayal Day to highlight India failures on various fronts of protests across India. The Kilwawe Volcano Cyclone Mikunu, which wreaked havoc in the Yemeni island of Socotra, strengthened in intensity as it bore down on southern Oman. Cyclone lashed the coast with high winds and rain. Civil defense authorities said they had evacuated 10,000 people to shelters, mainly inside Salala, which has a population of over 200,000. Authorities have urged residents to stay indoors. A wall containing hundreds of thousands of poppies has been unveiled in Washington in honor of fallen service members. The wall named the Poppy Memorial spans 133 feet and is filled with 645,000 poppies. Each flower represents a person who died in U.S. military service since World War I.